Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know, the really sad part of the so-called church world is we are in a war and people think the enemy is just some spiritual thing only. They don't even know who the enemy is. They don't even know who we're at war. And they think everybody or anybody could be saved. All they got to do is believe in Jesus. But uh, I don't know. Maybe they read a different Bible than I do. Oh, wait, that's right. Uh, I read the King James and a lot of them say that uh, if you believe the King James only, you're in some kind of crazy cult. Yeah, they'd rather read the NIV that's uh, printed by the same umbrella corporation that prints the uh, Satanic Bible by the Church of Satan. Yeah, the largest publishers of Bibles in the English-speaking world is owned by the company that prints gay porn and satanic bible by the church of satan yeah yeah and uh but hey uh if the tv preacher doesn't tell them who's gonna listen to me i mean i'm just some crazy guy you know but uh whatever all the answers are in the bible the king james all you got to do is read it read james chapter one pray for understanding Lord will give it to you if you ask. Um, all right, well, this is going to be chapter 8 of Judah Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. The name of this chapter is Samaria, Israel, Cast Out and Cast Off. So, yeah, I think I've covered enough about the... Um, Canaanites, I mean, if somebody, you know, can't uh, can't figure out why the sons of God in Genesis 6 are not humans, if they can't figure that out, well, I, you know, I, what can I tell you? You know, really? You're going to tell me that uh, believing men married unbelieving women and then they had giants for children with six fingers? And six toes really yeah why doesn't it happen today don't believers marry unbelievers today where's all these giants at? oh wait that's right they're playing for the nba and six toes yeah you mean like oprah winfrey halle berry uh marilyn monroe had i heard i don't know yeah all right, well, what can I tell you? I try warning people. I've been on YouTube for over 10 years now. Of course, originally I was doing it for the weddings, but uh, I soon realized it could be used for uh, Bible studies. So, all right, well, let's get reading here. Concerning the casting out of Israel, it is written, and it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, king of Judah, which was in the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel. Huh. Bob's note here. You got one king, a king of Israel, and another king that's king of Judah. But they're all Jews, right? They're all the same. They're all Jews. Yeah. Which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, the king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. Now remember, Samaria was the capital city of northern Israel. Jerusalem was the capital city of southern Judah. So here it is, the king of Assyria, the Syrian Empire, uh, had conquered much of Israel, 
And now they're laying siege to the capital city. So, the king of Assyria came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of the three years, they took it. Uh, you know what happens in three years when you can't go in or out to the city? Well, you run out of food. You know, unless, of course, you can run, uh, you can grow food inside the city, which there's usually not a lot of uh, land that you can grow food on. Possibly run out of water. You know, and what happens to your soldiers when they don't eat? They don't have any strength. They don't have any uh, energy, right? Yeah. So, Samaria was taken. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. So they took them out of where they lived and took them to a new place. Hey, you guys are going to be slaves and you're going to work our fields and you're going to do whatever we tell you to do. So why did this happen? Well, let's keep reading. Because they obeyed not, obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded and would not hear them nor do them. 2 Kings 18, 9 through 12. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, literally his forefront regard and or forefront favor, such as exp uh, is expressed in other places by the use of the words face and countenance, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day, and the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kudha, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and from Sepharvam, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Israel and dwelt in the cities thereof. 2 Kings 17, 23 and 24. If, as it is here in effect, the king of Assyria did take this ten tribe kingdom out of their own land, which is called Samaria, and then placed another people there instead of the children of Israel, then Samaria is the lawful home of those pre-Samaritans, the Egypto-Israelites of the Ephraim, Idish, or birthright kingdom, while those mongrel post-Samaritans who were gathered up from various places but were strangers and foreigners in that portion of the Abrahamic land grant, land grant known as Samaria. Bob's note here. Um, not all uh, Israel was taken out of the land. There was uh, a few Israelites that were left in the area around Samaria. When Jesus went to the woman at the well in Samaria, she said, Art thou greater than our father Abraham? Or was it Abraham or our father Jacob, I think she said. So she was an Israelite and she was in Samaria. But there was a lot of non-Israelites in Samaria, which is why the woman at the well said, For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And that's why, because... They were non-covenant people for the for a lot of them. I don't know about all of them, but you know. All right, let's keep reading. Following this record of the removal of Israel and the placing of these strangers in their former home, we have the following. And it was 
And so it was at the beginning of the dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let him go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests, which they carried away from Samaria, came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in their houses of the high places which the former Samaritans, the Israelites, had made every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. The men of Babylon make Sukkoth Benoth an idol, and the men of Kuth made uh, Nergalm another idol, and the men of Hamath made Ashima still another idol, and the Ivites made Nibha and Tartak still others, and the Sheparvites burnt their children in fire to a drama lick and Amenelech, the gods of Sheparavim. Can you imagine burning your children in a fire? Oof. Oh, wait, abortion. Is, is abortion much different? I don't know. All right, so let's keep reading. So they feared the Lord and made themselves of the lowest of them, priests of the high places which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places they feared the lord and served their own gods after the manner of nations joseph ephraim samaria israel whom they carried away from thence unto this day they do after the former manners second kings 17 25 through 34 yes after the former manner of idolatrous israel Yes, after the former matter of Israel, who feared, was afraid of the Lord, but served their own idol gods. Yes, after the former matter manner of Israel, who built those same high places, the groves, temples, and altars, and in them worshipped the works of their own hands. Yes, after the former manner of Israel, who rejected the priests of the Lord and made priests of the lowest of the people. Now, we're not talking about uh, dwarves or midgets, the lowest of the people. We're talking about those that are uh, the lowest of spiritual standards, I guess you could say. Yes, here is a perfect flower produced from the pollen of example and grown upon the plant of after the former manner. Yes, here is a clear case of gathering thistles when they should have had figs. And yet that poor priest whom they sent back was not to blame, for he himself was one of the lowest of his race. The blame lay behind him, Israel. The charges against the people of Israel is surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. And that is in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 20. And the Lord cried out, O Ephraim, thou hast committed whoredom, Israel is defiled. Hosea 5 and verse 3. Hosea is also used of the Lord to declare, Ephraim is smitten. My God shall cast them away because they did not hearken unto him. Thus the Lord declares, I will love them no more, but in the bitterness of his disappointment for this, is the same Lord that wept over Jerusalem, he cried out, O Ephraim, how shall I give thee up? No, no, that loving one did not want to cast them off, but they forsook him, forsook him. They would not have him to reign over them. They would no longer ask counsel of him after the judgment of Urim and Thummim, Thummim, T-H-U-M-M-I-M, Thummim, for the faithful, but rejected one declares, my people ask counsel of their stock, you know, their cattle and their calves, and their staff, 
or support or stay, declared unto them, For the spirit of whoredom hath caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. Hosea 4 and verse 12. Still he cries after them, Return, O backsliding Israel, return. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, for I am married unto you. I will heal your backsliding and love you freely. But they would not. Previous to this, the Lord had said that he was a husband to Israel. But now disappointed, he turns his heart more to the other kingdom, that of Judah, and says, Though thou Israel play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. Hosea 4.15 but as the story unfolds, we find that Judah offended worse than Israel. Judah offended worse than Israel. And that 130 years after the driving out of Israel, they, Judah, too, were carried into captivity, the captivity of Babylon. Bob's note here. Assyria was the world power a hundred some odd years, you know, prior. But then Babylon rose up in power and they conquered Assyria. And the Assyrian Empire collapsed. So when Israel was carried off into the territories of Assyria and then the entire army had left guarding the slaves and went to the front lines to fight against Babylon, and then all the Assyrian soldiers were killed. There was nobody left guarding the slaves. So what did Israel do? Uh, they said, hey, um, let's get out of here before we're slaves for somebody else, you know. So they packed their bags and they headed north. And if you look what's north, and the Bible even says Israel went north. I'd have to look it up, but uh, I cover it in another study. Yeah, let me look it up. But they went north. And you know what's north of Israel? Uh, Europe. Yeah. So let's look. Oh, okay, I had to look it up. You know, Bible only has three quarters of a million words. You know, like 700-something thousand words. So, uh, you know, Bob can't remember everything. Jeremiah chapter 3. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 3 is a very, very important chapter in the Bible. Very important. Talks about the divorce of Israel. Talks about the new covenant. And let's read Jeremiah 3.18. In those days... The house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Two different peoples. You know? Oh, no, they're not. They're all the same. They're all Jews, right? Yeah, uh, I don't think so. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north. And they shall come together out of the land of the north, to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. Go look at the, the land of Israel. Look at a map and go north. And tell me what's north of Israel. Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Real hard to figure out. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, what do I know? You know, I'm just some guy that's read the Bible once or twice. All right, uh, let's keep reading. But as the story unfolds, we find that Judah offended worse than Israel, and that 130 years after the driving out of Israel, they too were carried into captivity, the captivity of Babylon. So, Israel went north because um, Babylon was south of them. And 
you know, if you went east or west, you ran into more problems. So if they went north, uh, I'm sorry, if they went south, east, or west, they were running into a more, you know, either Egypt or Babylon. So they went north. And from what I understand, Europe was um, basically underpopulated or had hardly any population at all. So let's get out of Dodge. Let's get out of here. You know, they packed their bags and they, they left. Well, pack their tents, right? So they were the ones that uh, populated Europe. And oh, by the way, Judah was to be the kingly tribe, right? Well, you know what? Take a look at all the kings of Europe. Almost all of them are of German extraction. Almost all of them. Even the kings, the kings of England were of German extraction. Um, take a look at the old, old Germanic script, the writing, the alphabet, the old stuff like four or five hundred years ago. Look at those letters and compare them to he uh, ancient Hebrew. They look almost identical. Yeah. And when I st uh, lived in Germany in the army, um, I used to listen to the Germans. I took German in high school. Uh, wasn't very good at it, but, you know. And then when I started studying Hebrew in Bible college and what have you, I noticed the words sound very, very, Hebrew sounds like German. It really does. And who invented the printing press that gave us the Bible? Uh, Gutenberg? Do you know what Gutenberg even means? Guten means good. Berg means mountain. You ever heard of an iceberg? An ice mountain? Yeah. So his name means good mountain. Yeah, he gave us printing press with the Bible. You know, you wonder why the, the Antichrist, you know who's hate Germany so much? They know who the Germans are. They know who they are. That's why they wanted to, the wars and the killings and yeah. All right, Bob, shut up and keep get reading, reading this book. Since the head of I Ephraim is Samaria, Isaiah 7, 9, there need be no difficulty in understanding why the Lord should declare that the inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Avon, Hosea 10, 5. Beth Avon is defined as the house of vanities, vain or worthless emptiness which uh, when Jeroboam set up the two calves for Israel to worship, he set one up in Bethel, which means God's house. And by worshiping those idols, they turn the house of God into a house of vanity or wor uh, uh, worthlessness or a vain, hollow, unsatisfactory emptiness. Thus provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger, passionate suffering by their vanities. Uh, vain means worthless, by the way. Vanities, worthlessness. Hence the wail of the prophet. They trust in vanity and speak lies. Let us know carefully and we will get still clear like concerning the calf question. Israel hath cast the thing that is good, God in his care. The enemy shall pursue him because they cast off the protection of God. They have set up kings but not by me, their own, not the Lord's choice. They have made princes, feudal princes, not of royal line. And I knew, Hebrew, yada, a point, recognize it not. Of their silver and their gold, they have made themselves idols, calves, etc., that as a result, they may be cut off. The calf, the cause, O Samaria, hath cast thee off the result. Mine anger, long-suffering passion, is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they, Israel, attain to innocency, i.e. a lack of guilt, through the power of the calf to forgive or take that guilt away? And obviously, Bob's note here, worshiping a golden calf 
is not going to take sin away. You're just piling more sin on. So let's keep reading. For from Israel was it also the workmen made it, therefore it is not of God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Oof. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath left no standing corn, the bud shall yield no meal. If so, be it yield, the strangers, the post-Samaritans, shall swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up, now shall they be among the Gentiles, as a vessel wherein is no pleasure, for they are gone up to to Assyria, a wild ass alone, without God by himself. Ephraim has hired lovers, uh, i.e., having no loving care from the Lord. They hire someone else to love them. And if you don't know what a hired love servant is, well, um, gigolo, prostitute, yeah. Yes, though they have hired lovers among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall begin to sorrow in a little while for the burden of the king of princes. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be, be to him a sin. I have written to him the great things of my laws, but they were counted as a strange thing. They sacrificed other flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings, and eat it. But the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt, uh, you know, figuratively. They shall return to Egypt, um, you know, figuratively of captivity and bondage. For Israel hath forgotten his maker. Isaiah fully expra explains the expression. They shall begin to sorrow in a little while for the burden of the king of princes in the following. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger. What do you do with a rod? You you beat on somebody, right? Uh, spare the rod, spoil the child, right? O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. What is indignation? Extreme hatred. You see, God is using Assyria as the rod to spank or beat Assyria in his indignation or hatred. So let's keep reading. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? This is found in Isaiah chapter 10, 5 through 8. The last expression was an Assyrian boast. The Assyrian king really expected to destroy Israel and cut them off. But the word of God, word of God has gone forth that they shall never be destroyed. Totally. In order to punish them, he allowed the Assyrian to tread them down like mire in the streets. And further on, he refers to the Egyptian bondage and says that the Assyrian shall smite them with a rod and lift up his staff against them after the manner of Egypt. Bob's note here. Remember, in the book of Exodus, Israel was in bondage, slavery to Egypt. So let's keep reading. It is high time for us who lives in the realm of faith to throw off lethargy, arouse ourselves from our God-dishonoring stupidity and ignorance, and understand that the name Samaria has a prophetic significance as well as a historic one. Let's read that again. Uh, to know the future is to know the history of the past, at least in God's eyes. It is high time for us who live in the realm of faith to throw off our lethargy, arouse ourselves from our God-dishonoring stupidity and ignorance and understand that the name Samaria has a prophetic significance as well as a historic one. 
Yes, and that not only Samaria, but the names of Ephraim, Joseph, Rachel, Judah, Jacob, Israel, and many others have the same signification in the prophecies of the Bible that they have in its historic portions. That is, if the names Israel, Samaria, Ephraim, etc. are used in the history to designate the ten tribes Egypt, egypto israelitish birthright kingdom, then when those names are used prophetically, surely the prophecy involved must refer to the same people. This is also true of the terms Judah and the Jews. True, the name Israel often includes the Jews, for racially speaking, it is their national name, but it is used again and again and again when it has no reference whatsoever to the true Jewish people. In the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, the Lord has made an unconditional promise. Unconditional promise. What's an unconditional promise, Bob? Um, that is... That's a promise where the Lord's going to do it no matter what. No matter what anybody else does, the Lord will perform his promise. A conditional promise is like a contract. You do this, I'll do that. You want to buy my car? No problem. Give me the money, this much, I'll give you the car. No money, no car. But an unconditional promise would be Oh, I'm going to give you the car because you need it more than I do. So, big thing here. Um, there were a lot of conditional promises in the Bible from the Lord. And then there's some unconditional promises. That's why I'm spending so much time, you know, differentiating. In the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, the Lord has made an unconditional promise to the birthright nation this promise is given in clear, definite, and unmistakable language, which declares that they shall consider it in the last days, the last days, and in which he uses the names of Jacob, Ephraim, Israel, and Samaria together with the names of Rachel, the mother of the birthright family. It is in this prophecy that the Lord makes use of the expression, I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. In connection with which he says, he that scattered Israel will gather him and commands that this be told in the land where Ephraim is living in the last days. Bob's note, I think that's Europe and where Europeans spread out to, whether it be Australia, Canada, New Zealand, USA, whatever. Um... He that scattered Israel will gather him and commands that this be told in the land where Ephraim is living in the last days. He also says to them in the same promise, Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. And to this he further adds, A great company shall return thither. Return thither? Where? To the place from where they came. Samaria. Who? Jacob, Rachel, Joseph, Ephraim, Samaria, Israel. It is well known fact that the Jews went into the Babylonian captivity, but it is much more fully known that they returned from that captiv captivity. Yeah, uh, Bob's note. 70 years, is, uh, Judah went into captivity in Babylon. 70 years later, they returned, just like uh, the prophet said. But that's another study altogether. Uh, it is well known fact that the Jews went into the Babylonian captivity but it is much more fully known that they returned from that captivity and dwelt for a short season in Judea or Jewry. But aside from that one priest who was brought back from among the captives of Israel and who dwelt in Bethel, that he might teach those mongrel post-Samaritans the manner of the God of the land, there is not one word of history, sacred or profane, to show that any tribe, tribes, or remnants of tribes of those pre-Samaritans, the children of Israel, who composed the northern kingdom, had ever returned to and dwelt in their former home. That is, that portion of the land which the Lord God of heaven and earth promised to their fathers, which is known in biblical history as Samaria and all Israel, in 
contradistinction from that which is known as all Judah and Jewry, which was the home of the Jews. In another chapter, we have given the details of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, but just at present, we desire to call your attention to the fact that their captivity occurred around 588 BC, according to Usher's chronology, which is not correct by more than eight years, but is sufficiently correct for our present purpose. And the perf first prophecy uttered concerning that captivity was 623 BC, and the last one 23 years later, i.e. 600 BC. But the prophet Amos had prophesied concerning the captivity and return from captivity of the 10 tribed kingdom 164 years prior to the first intimidation that the Jews would ever go into captivity and 199 years before they were carried away into captivity. In writing concerning the captivity of the 10 tribes, the names which Amos used to designate them are Samaria, used four times, Joseph, used three times, Isaac, used twice, Bethel, used five times, and Israel, used 17 times. Amos is the only one of the prophets who applied the name of Isaac to either one of the two kingdoms, but there can be no possible doubt that Amos gives the name of Isaac to the ten, tri ten tribed kingdom. The first verse in the book of Amos reads, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jer Jeroboam, that is Jeroboam the second son of Joash, king of Israel. He uses the title of Isaac as follows. And the high places, groves of, for worship, of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries, Bethel and Dan of Israel, shall be laid waste. And I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam, king of ten tribes Israel, with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, the place where they went to worship the calf, sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to hear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, S-E-E-R, uh, Bob's note here, seer was just a, an old, old time name for prophet. S-E-E-R, seer, because they could foresee the future. So, O thou seer, go flee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel. Amos 7, 9 through 15. Uh, Bob's note here. If you wanted to have a very short lifespan, well, it doesn't matter what you want, but uh, let's just say that prophets of the Lord had very short lifespans when sin abounded. So, yeah, you tell the people things they don't want to hear and they kill you. Uh, can I get an amen here? Why did they kill Jesus? Why did they want to kill Jesus? Because he told them things they didn't want to hear. And by the way, Jesus is and was a prophet and a high priest and coming king. Prophet, priest, and king. He fulfills all those offices and more. In the, days of jo in the days of Joshua, when the land of Canaan was divided by Lot, Bethel fell to the house of Joseph. Thus we find it in possession of one birthright kingdom and used as the chapel of this idolatrous king. For Jeroboam the first had polluted it with one of the calves. While it is true that this people were taken to Assyria and were given a promise that they would eventually return, there is something else which must first occur. For the Lord has said of them that after they were cast out, he would sift, sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, 
yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. A sieve is just like a, a strainer, like a screen strainer. Uh, you would use that to sift uh, flour, like when you're baking bread and you don't want lumps, you know. You know, that's, that's what a sifter is, guys. And maybe some of you gals don't um, bake. I don't know. I used to like helping mom cook in the kitchen. I, I, I liked learning how to cook. Because I like to eat. So, didn't always have money for Burger King, right? Boy, I used to eat five times a day. Couldn't gain a pound. Girls used to complain how skinny you are. Why don't you eat and gain some weight? Seriously, I tried. Didn't do any good. Would lift weights, didn't do any good. I mean, I gave up. I had the body of a runner. Well, that was when I was in my 20s, 30, well, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s. And not so much in the 50s, but you know, what can I tell you? Then after giving this prophecy concerning the sifting of the house of Israel among all nations, Amos prophesies concerning their return as follows. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall make them gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord, thy God. Amos 9, 14 and 15. People, I have done commentaries on Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and all the minor prophets, including Amos and Hosea. They're wonderful books. Wonderful books. You know... I learn, trust me, I learn a lot by doing these um, Bible studies. Matter of fact, um, I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was a teacher in college. He says, if you ever want to learn a subject really well, teach it. He says, the students will ask you questions and by the time you dig the answer out, you'll know a lot more about it than you did before. And because if you're not teaching it right to where they don't understand, they're going to ask you a bunch of questions. And, uh, you know, so I used to do some training and stuff. And, you know, you got to realize that somebody has no knowledge at all. So, you know, first you got to teach them the ABCs and then you teach them the two and three letter words. And, uh, you know, dog, D-O-G, cat, C-A-T. Um, you know, and then uh, you, you just keep building on it. And if you're messing up, they're going to let you know. Hey, I don't understand. What are you talking about, Bob? Um, that's why a lot of times I go into details because you got to realize, I don't know if somebody has been listening to me for five years or, uh, five minutes. So, all right. So, but the minor prophets are small books, but boy, I'll tell you what, they're packed, packed with prophecy. A lot of it, future prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled. So, oh, that's why I say, if anybody's interested, um, shoot me an email, get me a USB or an SD card, and I'll give you all my Bible studies. Um, I hope the, the lady that was hosting a website with all my Bible studies, her website's not working. I know she was not in the best of health. Um, please pray for her. She was in Chicago. Um, I don't know what happened to her. No idea. 
Chicago, man. Oof, what a bad city. Do you know that Chicago um, had more murders in just that one city um, a couple of years ago or recently than the entire United States had in 1960, according to the FBI statistics? Of course, in 1960s, we had segregation. We had prayer and Bible reading in Jesus' name in public schools. There was no Church of Satan. Abortion wasn't legal. We didn't have the LB and the, um, uh, you know, the uh, GT um, rights and uh, pride thingy. Uh, yeah, it was a different world. Men had crew cuts. Women wore long dresses. No thong bikinis. They would have been arrested for indecent exposure. It was a different world back then. And the 60s really changed everything. Rock and roll, drugs, yeah. That's the time I, well, I mean, I was a little kid. I basically grew up in the 70s, but I saw, I saw, you know. I watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and Elvis Presley on TV. So, yeah, that's what I grew up with. The drugs, the rock and roll, and yeah. Everything that the Lord hates. Let's keep reading. But in spite of the fact that this prophecy was written two centuries before the Jews were sent into captivity, while they were yet counted among the faithful saints, it having no application to them whatsoever, and that when fulfilled, the people to whom it refers shall no more be pulled up out of their land. There are theory-bound men who are so determined that everything Israelitish shall be Jewish that they have the audacity to tell us that this prophecy was fulfilled when the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity. Now you got to remember something. This book was written a hundred years ago, before the Israeli state was created by the Antichrist United Nations in 1948. Do you know that the United Nations, uh, the Antichrist United Nations, that was their first act, was the creation of the Israeli state. Yeah. And they had a publishing company attached to them uh, that's present name is Lucis Trust. Used to be called Lucifer Publishing. <laughs> yeah. I think you get the idea, right? Yeah. And then everybody says, oh, yeah, the, the Israeli state is the uh, fulfillment of Bible prophecy of them returning to the land. Oh, uh, yeah, you could say that. If the United Nations and the uh, Lucifer is your, your God, then, yeah, they're returning to the land. Uh, you, mean, you mean like uh, the Canaanites were in the land before? Yeah. Yeah, the, the Canaanites were in the land before Israel. So yeah, the, the, they're, they're back in the land all right. Gog and Magog, if you ask me. So, all right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.